Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's lunch hour lecture. My name's Jack Ashby from the Grant Museum of Zoology here at UCL, and I'm here to uh, host you to welcome our, today, our speaker today, um, which is Dr. Sarah Hawkes, who is a reader in global health here at UCL's uh, Institute for Global Health. Um, she leads research groups in, a, a research group investigating the links between um, empirical evidence and policy response in sexual health and HIV. And she's also a Wellcome Trust Senior Research Fellow in, in International Public Engagement and works extensively um, with the World Health Organization on various expert groups on sexual health and uh, sexually transmitted infections. So she's perfectly placed to give today's lecture, <coughs> Does Gender Make You Sick? If you could join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Hawkes. Thank you very much, and I'm really delighted to see people willing to give up their lunch times as opposed to sitting at their desks and having a sandwich. It's, uh, it, it's great that, that you're all here, um, and welcome to year 11, is it? It's, thank you for coming. And year 10. And year 10. And you, and, well, welcome to all of you. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to start with a little, oh, a little background story, if I can get the slides to work correctly. <laughs> I graduated from this august institution um, about 25 years ago in, with a degree in sociology and a degree in medicine. And being young and idealistic, I soon found myself a job um, doing what I'd originally gone into medicine to do, which was to travel. <laughs> So I found a job in Bangladesh, and I took myself off to the largest research organization based in a developing country. And the purpose of my job, I'd come from the, the world of sexual health, which means essentially the sexually transmitted infection, gum clinics that um, we have here in, in the NHS. I, I was asked to go to Bangladesh for four years and run a project looking at the rates of sexually transmitted infections in <coughs> women. And I took the job willingly and got out there and thought, well, this is a bit odd. Why are they asking me to focus on women? Here's a society where they've developed a program of health service delivery that is just for women, but recognises that those women aren't actually allowed to leave their homes. So what you see here is a health worker giving a shot of Depo-Provera, which is a, a long-acting contraceptive, to a woman who is not allowed to actually leave her compound and go to a health facility. Whereas the men, they were on the move all the time. It's a deltaic plane, as you know, so they move around in boats. They not only ran all the markets, but they were the ones doing the shopping. And the men were the ones who held other forms of power in society. So it really struck me that if you wanted to look at the control of a disease transmitted through sex, which would include HIV, then it seemed a bit um, head over heels to be focusing on the group in society that had the least power the least ability to make decisions for themselves, and the least ability to put themselves at risk of a sexually transmitted infection, except if they were being infected by their husbands. So I published a paper to that effect, finally. It took a very long time to get a paper like that published. Um, and yet still, when the World Bank came in a couple of years later, armed with my fantastic evidence base, they still decided to put all of their money for STI and HIV control into programs for women. So the more I looked at it, the more I thought, well, it's actually just following on a sort of historical trend, the idea that women are responsible for these kinds of infections and that men just need a couple of shots of penicillin and they can carry on as is seems to be a sort of historical precedent for the kind of work that I was um, being asked to do in Bangladesh. So as I say, that, that was probably about 15 years ago that finally I finished all of the, the work and published all these papers. And by now I 
carved out a career in sexual health and gender analysis. And I resurrected my um, career in gender analysis more, more recently um, to try and explain why is it that we see evidence that shows one group in society may have a risk, and yet our policy responses are something different. And to me, what explained the difference, obviously, in Bangladesh, was gender. So I, I just want to be sure that we all understand what, what gender means. There are various academic treatises defining gender as relational or situational or um, in, in, in other academic terms. But the, the terminology that I'm most comfortable in using is that gender is essentially defined as socially constructed roles. Each of us know what it means to be a man or to be a woman in any society. We might change our gender roles as we go through life. We may, might change our gender roles, um, our gender identities, how we express our gender identity as we go through the day. The woman who works for JP Morgan in the city expresses her gender role in a very different way in the boardroom compared to the bedroom or the nursery or the pub. So our ability to express our, ident our gender identity is not static. Gender norms, as you probably realise, are set very early. And I have included this partly because I think it's a wonderful quote from a, an American political gender activist but also because it's a lovely picture of my own daughter, 10 minutes after birth, and somebody had helpfully and thoughtfully already placed a pink hat on her head just to reinforce her gender identity, I think, and keep her warm. Gender norms are pretty universal. They traverse time and place. I found this advert. I think it's the most fantastic advert for explaining the mindset of the current generation leading corporate and political America. When they were growing up in the 1950s, their every dream was to own a daisy air rifle. Like millions of clean-cut and alert American boys, they would develop their character and manliness through owning a gun. And his picture I took in a market in Oman just a couple of years ago, um, showing that basically things never change in some settings. But gender norms are not fixed. I've included this picture to remind you that gender norms are socially constructed and they can be reconstructed. So this is a picture of me wearing gender appropriate pink. You'll be able to spot me on the, the photos there inside um, a, um, a house with uh, um, it's a house full of transgender sex workers in Pakistan in the in the slums of Karachi so these are people who were born as biological males but when you interview them they will tell you that deep inside they have a feminine soul and so they have spent their lives expressing their gender identity as women, even though biologically they're male. They don't have any surgery, they're not taking any hormones, they're expressing themselves as women. So gender norms are not fixed, they're socially constructed. So what led me on the path to this particular lecture was that 20 years after my experiences in Bangladesh, The Lancet published an enormous <coughs> global study of what of, of what's called the burden of disease. So this is a huge 10-year exercise, happens every decade, um, to try and identify what makes societies sick, what puts them at risk of getting sick, and essentially what we're all going to die from. And the importance of this data set um, is that it really sets the priorities for where funding from health systems, from governments, from donors, should go for the next 10 years. So in the 1990s, when the data set showed that HIV and tuberculosis and malaria were very big problems in, in the world, money went into the control of those diseases. But I've included two pictures here that I hope show you 
the headline news from the most recent global, global Burden of Disease study, which was published in December, which is that we're all going to live longer, certainly than our parents' generation did. Childhood mortality is coming down throughout the world. And essentially, rather than all of us being at risk from infectious diseases, what we're all going to be at risk from in the future is the non-communicable diseases, the chronic diseases, because we're living long longer. So I started to think about these disease patterns and as they, uh, how they're changing, and I thought, I'll look at that for, through a gender lens. And that's what I want to present to you in the next few slides. What happens when we look at the data that's presented by um, this, it, it's a collection of 400 research groups throughout the world, which in and of itself is an enormous achievement. To get 400 universities to collaborate with each other is the proverbial herding cats achievement. Um, but what do their data show? Well, sorry, just I'm going to take one slide which makes me sound like I truly do work for a university and explain to you what a DALI is, a Disability Adjusted Life Year, because this is the metric by which health economists measure um, the importance attached to certain diseases. A DALI is essentially one healthy year of life lost. So if a baby is born and dies, it's essentially lost about 80 healthy years of life. If somebody gets sick at the age of 70 and dies, they've lost about 10 DALIs. Now that's a, a very approximate calculation, but essentially the DALIs are just a measure of years of life lost and a way of telling us which diseases are not just common, but which diseases are important in terms of their ability to make us sick, chronically sick, or kill us. So here's what we find for the top 10 DALIs globally. And th th you, you may well know some of these, these sort of headline figures. As I said, the, the figures indicated that unlike 10 years ago, the world has shifted to a situation where um, five of the 10 are related to chronic disease. So we're moving, the whole world is moving away from an, a, 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 a priority around infectious disease to these chronic diseases um, and conditions. So being a very simple epidemiologist, I simply split those DALI data into blue for men and red for women. And what you find for every one of the top 10 DALIs is that they're more common, in, they're more burdensome in men than they are in women. And if uh, I've, I've, you're going to see some, fig, uh, some rings around some of the figures, because I've highlighted what I think is um, some important gender-driven differences in these DALI and mortality data. So you'll see essentially three times more men get killed on the road than women do globally. That's what that, that figure shows you. The DALI burden with road injuries is mainly death through road injury. Why do people get sick? Well, they get sick because they take risks. Every, all of us, every time we cross a road, every time we open the, the door and breathe in polluted air, every time we eat a McDonald's, we are taking a risk. And so, what those um, clever epidemiologists were able to do is look at what are the risk factors driving those DALI outcomes. And again, here are the top 10 risk factors globally. And it's probably not any surprise to any of you that these individual level risk factors like tobacco and alcohol um, and not eating enough fruit in the mornings are going to make us sick eventually. And again, if we look at blue for boys and red for girls, we see that most of the risk behaviours are borne by men. And again, for two of the most common, the, the highest burden risk problems, what we see is for tobacco and alcohol, 
about three times more risk-taking, more DALI-driven risk outcomes in men compared to women globally. Can we explain that through biology? Well, the way to look at that would be to look at young children. Do we see such huge differentials in young children? If we did, then we'd simply say, well, all of that is down to men essentially being physically less able to cope with the 21st century than women are. But we don't. What we see in, in small children, age zero to four, is actually the DALI figures are pretty equal. We're not seeing a big um, biological difference. We, we do see some biological differences. We know that baby boys are weaker than baby girls, but we don't see an enormous difference in the way that we see in um, across all of the age ranges, and particularly for adults. Oh, that's gone slightly skew with, but if you, were to, if you were able to turn your heads to the side and look at that, what you would essentially see is that by the time we get to year, what's, year, what's age 10, year 6? By the time we get to year 6, up until we're 24, we start to see gender norms coming in. And what you see in terms of gender norms is that at a global level, the girls start to become anxious and depressed and globally they have less access to good nutrition than boys do. And the boys start to drive fast cars badly and they start to get injured and killed on the roads. There's a common perception, particularly in global health, that interpersonal violence, gender-based violence, a phrase that we hear again and again in the media, in the published literature, is something that men do to women. But if we actually look at the DALI data, it's not denying that men beat up and kill women, but much more they beat up and kill other men. So if you look at um, not just interpersonal violence, men beating up other men, but men killing themselves, they do it at a far higher rate than women do. So that's your DALI data, that's your disease data, your burden data. What about male mortality? Well, I'm just very briefly going to point out to you that where we see the biggest differentials are around lung cancer because of smoking and road injuries because of all that fast car driving um, that I talked about before. So the summary, the headline summary on that is men take more risks, men get sicker, and men die younger. So some people have tried to explain this by saying it's all down to testosterone. That you can explain all of this through biology, but as I hope I've managed to convince you that there's very little hard evidence that all of this is just due to biology, by looking at the, the children's data, we can see some of that. What I want to suggest to you this lunchtime is a lot of that is actually being driven by a profit margin. That what we're actually talking about is behaviours that are driven, marketed and sold to us by, in the words of but you don't need to take my word for it, the Director General of the World Health Organization, Margaret Chan, we're talking about corporations that are big, rich, powerful, driven by profit, and far less friendly to health than those of us that work in global health. So, I did a really simple look on Google um, to see, well, you know, what, is, what kind of role do these in, do industries play in perpetuating gender norms. So I just want to throw a few ideas at you. So here's an obvious gender norm. Everybody knows the story of the Marlborough man, and everybody knows that three of the four Marlborough men died of lung cancer. But what we're seeing again and again in these kinds of uh, gender-setting examples is the idea that to smoke, to drink, and you're about to see, to drive fast cars, is a masculine activity. To be a real man, you have to have lots of girls. You also have to have lots of alcohol. 
And I've included this just to show the sort of all-pervasive nature of the idea of the links between gender, masculinities, and big business. 95% of advertising in sport in this country is from the alcohol industry is directed at men's sport. Only 5% of what the alcohol industry spends on sponsoring sport goes to women's sport. So when you look at, and this, this, is, this is a global phenomenon, those of you that follow Thai football will immediately notice that, the, that you see the same kind of advertising um, linked to the alcohol industry in Thai football too. Whereas if you do a Google search on women and alcohol, what it seems to suggest is that, well, first of all, you have to make yourself semi-naked to enjoy a good drink these days. <laughs> but it also, interestingly, comes up with a set of adverts about how wrong it is for girls to drink. You don't see these kind of adverts being pushed on boys. For girls, there's a lot of bad things that are going to ha happen to you, which is probably true if you have too much to drink on a Friday or Saturday or Tuesday night. What about road traffic accidents? Now, when I put this, I, I took this slide in just outside a market in Shiraz in, in Iran. And when, you, when I show this kind of slide in most gender um, conferences, of course, you know, you can predict the kind of... Um, response that comes back to you that here is a, a, a profound example of a gender oppressive, gender unequal society, etc, etc. But I want you to focus not on the women um, and their position in society, but on that little wheel that you see, that motorbike. And take a look at these figures. One person in Iran dies on the road every 20 minutes, and four out of five of them are young men. Gender norms that prevent young women from having access to being able to drive cars, they're not truck drivers, they're not taxi drivers, they're not commercially on the road. It means that the people on the road with all of their testosterone and all of their risk taking are young men who are killing each other globally at a rate of a million young men a year dying on the roads globally. Who's pushing all of that? Well, it's no coincidence that when you see adverts for cars, they're generally directed at the testosterone-driven male driver, as opposed to the safer female driver. But as I said, gender norms globally are changing. What was acceptable just for boys 20 years ago is now a set of behaviours experienced by girls or being partaken of by girls globally too. I live in central Cambridge. When I go out into Cambridge on a Friday night, and I'm sure it's the same around Tottenham Court, Court Road on a Friday night, you see as many drunk girls, probably more drunk girls, compared to drunk boys. Gender norms are not static. Girls across Europe are now binge drinking at the same rate that boys across Europe are binge drinking. And as you see from these statistics, uh, sorry, from, the, from these headlines, there are the same concerns across various other parts of um, the, the developing or developed world. These are uh, headlines from India and China. Does that matter? Well, actually, yes, I think it does matter. And this is um, a graph that I'm going to just take a moment to explain to you, this is from, the World Health from a World Health Organization paper. And what it essentially shows you along the bottom axis is national levels of gender empowerment, levels of equality or inequality between the sexes in any one society. So right down here on the left-hand side, we have Bangladesh, a very gender unequal society. Up at the top with the circle around it, we have Sweden, which at a national level is a very gender equal society. But what we see on the, um, on the vertical axis is that that's the ratio of female to male smokers. So right down in gender unequal Bangladesh, you've got about one female smoker for every 99 male smokers. 
But by the time we move into a gender equal society where women have the right to choose, women can behave now just like men, in Sweden, you've got more women smoking than men smoking. And we see very similar patterns emerging across the data sets from young people um, across Europe, that we're seeing more girls taking up smoking than boys. What explains that? Here's a picture from um, my summer holiday in Burma with a headline from um, a, an industry paper, <coughs> The Tobacco Reporter, which really shows that they're smoking because industry, the tobacco industry, has totally noticed that the one bit of the market segment that they haven't picked up on till now is girls. So all of their marketing strategy across Asia and soon to be across Africa is directed at girls. So the biggest rates of increase now and in the future will be among girls who are simply being subjected to um, market-driven advertising. <clears throat> How does the global health community respond to this? Well, surprisingly, given everything I've said, the World Bank actually does pretty well. They understand that what gender means. It means men and women. They put a gender-responsive framework into all their work. The World Health Organization, again, on paper, <clears throat> doesn't do badly, tells us it's going to have gender-responsive approaches, and then has a gender, women, and health network. The um, unit in the World Health Organization that's responsible for gender is called Gender and Women's Health, as if all of that data that they hold, they are the repository of all of the data I've shown you, they haven't noticed that it's actually men who get sick and die before women do. The big funders, the people with the cash, these are the people putting billions of taxpayers' money into the control of specific diseases around the world. They're only interested in women. They're really, their whole gender focus is on women's risks. What about the biggest one of all? Bill Gates and his wife. <laughs> Gender inappropriate to leave her out the title. We've no idea. They don't use the term gender at all. The only program that they have got that um, disaggregates by sex is um, their tobacco control program and, and their $700 million tobacco control program, um, almost all of it goes on women. So I hope within, within the one minute remaining to me, to me, I've managed to convince you that gender, gender norms as driven by big business is making us sick. Most of all, I hope I've managed to convince you that gender means the health of everybody. It does not mean women's health. No matter how many times you read that in published papers, in the press, hear it on the radio, see it on the net, gender means all of us. All of us have a gender identity. Big business knows that. They exploit our gender identities, what we as a society set up as our ideal gender norms. But gender norms are changing. I'm really so thrilled to have an opportunity to speak to the generation where gender, gender norms are changing far more than happened for my generation, for example. Because what that means is not that we shouldn't be changing gender norms. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be as equal um, participants in society, no matter whether you're male or female, but to examine what kind of gender equality we want. Do women really just want to take the same kind of risks that men have been taking for decades? Is that really a mark of empowerment? So what can we do about it? Well, as an epidemiologist, I have to make a plea for disaggregating the data. If they hadn't had the bright idea to split those data into male and female, I wouldn't be telling you all this fascinating stuff today. So please, if you ever get a chance to work on data sets, remember to disaggregate. I've already made my little plea there. And finally, since we're in UCL, just a plea to recognise that gender is a political issue. It's driven by specific interests. And we, as a global health, global community, 
need specific interests to address it back. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Sarah. That was a really fantastic talk. We do have time for questions. If you do have a question, just wait for a microphone to reach you so people watching online can hear you. Does anyone have a question? I have a question. <laughs> oh, there's one here. Do you come down? Oh, sorry, just wait for the microphone. Oh, oh there's another one. Go for it. Up there. Come to you next. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for a really interesting lecture. I very much enjoyed that. Um, I've been working in the uh, men's health field in the UK and more recently in Europe and internationally for over 20 years now. Um, and what always surprises me, I mean, this data is, this, the sex uh, disaggregated data has been well known for years. Um, we know that men's outcomes are in many ways far worse than women's. Um, but um, I'd be interested to know your views about why that, that hasn't been uh, acknowledged and actually responded to in any serious way. I mean, you've, 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 you've mapped it out and you've described it very well and you've talked about what, what we need to do next, but why, why are we in this mess um, in the first place? That's not to say that women's health is not important. Of course it is, but men's health is important too. And so why, why has it been overlooked up, up until now? So my hunch on that, and I can't talk for the European region, I can only talk for my experiences in Asia. My hunch for that is that um, 30, 40 years ago, we had a movement that was called the primary healthcare movement, which was a movement designed to deliver um, essential services, essential health services to the entire world. And the entire world soon figured out they couldn't afford primary healthcare and they went for what was called selective primary health care, where they figured out their top five priorities. And when you look at their top five priorities, essentially what they were concerned with was population control and making babies healthy. So for everybody else, you fell by the wayside. It's not that we have a focus just on women. We don't. By the time you're my age, the health services in most countries really don't give a damn. They're only really concerned for most health services about women who have reproductive capacity. They want to keep them healthy. And they want to keep their infants healthy. Everybody else just has to make their own way in the world as far as health services are concerned. As far as everything else is concerned, what drives gender, I think that's a reflection of changing societal norms. You wouldn't have had these figures to quite such um, an extent 20 years ago when you had more gender inequality. Thank you, fascinating talk. Um, I'm wondering if the reason why those who perhaps out of goodwill focus on women when they try to deal with these gender um, related issues on health, maybe it's a carryover from the attitude that you often find in economic empowerment. Mm. Like, for instance, microfinance in Bangladesh. Famously, we only lend to women because, or, we, or in other areas, we focus on women's literacy mm. because if we do that, then they'll take care of the kids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm wondering if global health is an area where this women-centric model of advancement runs afoul of reality, because as you mentioned, here is where actually the men are the ones that are getting the, uh, the bigger risk. Thank you. I think that's a, a, a really, again, a really, really important lens through, through which to, 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 to view all of this. So there is absolutely no denying that all over the world, men have more power, more economic advantage, more, um, more abilities to express themselves in most societies still. That means that women haven't had the ability to go out and buy cigarettes, to go out and buy alcohol, to go out and drive cars. It therefore, I think, you know, it buys into this stereotype of poor, vulnerable women. And we just need to focus on the women because we make women equal to men, which is of course <laughs> exactly what we should be doing, but without thinking through what does that mean in terms of 
what we're not providing for men already and what the change in behaviour for women will be in the future. So, you know, coming after four years in, in Bangladesh, yes, you see thousands upon thousands of microcredit programmes focused on women and you see a lot of male resentment of that and you see a lot of men who feel totally disempowered and totally outside of the political system because the focus is going on women. I think if you were to analyse development from a poverty lens as opposed to a gender lens, you'd come up with a very different set of programmes. You'd start talking about equality for everybody. But a lot of people in decision-making positions find that a very threatening idea. It's much more politically acceptable to talk about poor, vulnerable women than the poor. Are there any other questions? Someone in the middle here. Thanks. Just going back to your nature and nurture bar charts, virtually every comparison showed that men were at greater risk than, than women, including the, the naught to four-year-olds, mm. where, again, every, every boy was at greater risk than every girl. I just wonder why, therefore, you leap straight off and conclude, therefore, it must be to do with nurture, not nature, just because the, the comparison was less at that age. And w why wouldn't you expect to see uh, sort of an extrapolation, a, a, a rising curve of that difference as children become adults and get older. Why, why conclude automatically that the issue must be nurture in every case? I can imagine you know, boy racing and drinking and smoking, yes, although it may be changing, but there seem to be, I'm not a medical person or a statistician, but it seemed to me there are enough items in there that could just be inherent and down to nature. So you're, you're right that there are some differences, but the, the differences aren't as dramatic. And the d differences even out by the time... Well, the one slide I haven't got in here is, is the five to nine-year-old, what happens there. So the differences even out, but then they start to come in to outcomes that are societal-driven. If you look at you know, nutrition or um, alcohol or tobacco, those aren't around nature, those are around nurture questions, those are societal decisions. And that's where we see the biggest differences between men and women. That, that, that's why I had those rings around with the number three. That, that those differences, perhaps some of it, perhaps some of the differences around alcohol can be explained by the fact that actually women don't metabolise alcohol as fast or as well as men do. So, it takes a lot less to get a woman drunk than a man drunk in, in terms of units of alcohol. But that wouldn't explain um, all of the differences that we see in every country that shows that the vast burden of alcohol-driven problems are borne by men, not by women. That's about the amount of alcohol that men drink. It's not about their biological ability to metabolise alcohol. And the same for most of those big differences. So, the, the, it, so to, tobacco, alcohol, violence, road accidents, those are um, behaviour-driven differences, not biological-driven differences. OK, I'm afraid that is all we've got time for. I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions. But most of all, thank you to Dr. Sarah Hawkes. <laughs>